Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm going to put up a quick review of Chapter 10 for business law, and I promise you it's pretty short because it's about illegal contracts. And the bottom line is, if a contract is for an illegal purpose or against what we call public policy or sort of shocks the conscience of of uh, of our society, the contract will be deemed void. And it's a pretty common sense principle. But not all contracts that are illegal are necessarily criminal. The, the ones that usually jump out at you is it's obviously not an enforceable contract if you hired someone to beat up another person and that person didn't perform. Could you sue them? Or vice versa, they did beat up the person, but you didn't pay them. Could they enforce payment in a court of law because of breach of contract? No, because the contracts are what? Void and therefore unenforceable. Those are the illegal ones that are also criminal. They jump right out at you. You know, if it's a, if, if it's calls for the commission of a crime, it will be void as an illegal agreement. But some contracts that are illegal have nothing to do with criminality and have nothing to do with our common sense um, sort of moral code. They're just technically illegal. The one I was thinking of not too long ago was a friend of mine bought um, a certain kind of pipes that go on is Harley Davidson, they make a big loud rumble, and he was telling me they were illegal. So could the argument be made there that in the portion of the contract when it was executor, executory, he finds out they're illegal in Massachusetts based upon an emission standards or something, I don't know, or, or maybe the, 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 the loudness of them. Could he walk away and basically rescind or void the obligation because in fact it called for an illegal um, um, contract. Well, there's an argument, yes, but the contract isn't to put the pipes on. It's just for the pipes. So there's an argument that contract could still go forward. But think about it, there's certain illegal items that, w that might need a prescription, for example, but at one time you could buy over the counter and you have a contract currently to buy a certain amount of those for your health and herbal store. But you realize now in this executory stage, it's actually illegal to purchase those, um, those herbs or, or, or medicines, if you will, without uh, some kind of prescription or FDA approval. And that makes the contract illegal and therefore unenforceable. What do we do if we have an illegal agreement? We leave the parties where we find them. So if it's executed, it's over, it's done. The, the, the court's not gonna undo it. What if one party's performed? The court's not gonna force the other party to perform. And so it leaves them where they stand. Otherwise the court would be, for be forced to help complete, arguably, an illegal transaction. The book outlines the major illegal ones, gambling contracts, obviously gambling contracts at a licensed casino, or when you play the lottery in a, a state system that has a legitimate lottery system, those are legal gambling contracts and they're fully enforceable. We're talking about the illegal ones. You call up a bookie, you place a bet on the Patriots, you lose, and now can the bookie sue you in a court of law? No. Because it's an illegal contract, it's unenforceable. Doesn't mean you don't have other ramifications you might have to deal with. I actually represented uh, somebody involved in something like that where they thought they were doing a good uh, business plan where all the bets that were placed with them, actually he reduced to written form, had the better sign the slip, date it, and when they didn't pay, he decided instead of you know doing old school and, I don't know, threatening or harassing the person who owed the money, he, uh, he actually sued them in small claims court. That's when I got involved because the matter was referred over to the district attorney's office and he was charged with um, several crimes. <laughs> but it's interesting. So gambling contracts, uh, those are completely illegal and unenforceable. Sunday contracts are no longer are nearly as significant as they once were. And they, in fact, they may actually still be enforceable in some realms, even if technically certain merchants or uh, contracting parties are supposed to be um, banned from doing that conduct on Sunday. This is a relatively uh, new phenomenon, meaning that Sunday contracts are no longer a big deal. When I was a kid, if you went up to the area where the, the, the large malls were and stuff, well, they weren't really called malls back then, but there'd be like a strip of stores where I grew up in Springfield, Mass. And I remember actually there used to be people with remote control airplanes used to use the, the, the big large parking lot to fly planes. Why? No one was there. It was illegal to have those stores open on a Sunday. In theory, if you contracted to do business on that day, that contract might be deemed illegal and unenforceable. Sunday contracts are no longer that big a deal. In fact, um, other than for liquor, I can't imagine any of them being unenforceable because of the fact that they were uh, executed and or um, created during a Sunday period of time. But at one time in our society, it was a really big deal. Um, 
I remember when I was a kid, if, you, if, if it was Sunday morning and you, you had something you wanted to, to buy or do, you forget about it. Other than gas and milk, you're lucky if you could get anything. Um, even batteries were tough to get back then uh, on a Sunday. I have a distinct remember, memory about getting a gift on a Saturday night for my birthday and, and I needed batteries and we couldn't get them on Sunday. Uh, that was before we had convenience stores. I'm showing my age. Your serious contract's a bigger issue, and some of you already saw that. Some of you took the test a little early, I think, um, or I'm a little late posting this video. A usurious contract um, is a term that suggests that the interest rate is illegal. In fact, our society does believe that interest rates that go too high are um, against public policy and therefore a crime. On the federal level, and it's mostly consistent throughout the states, somewhere around 35%. I don't have it right in front of me. But if you tried to charge a rate more than that per annum, per year, it would be deemed usurious or over the maximum rate allowed by law. So what happens in that circumstance? It depends how egregious the behavior is. If it's just slightly over and it's more of a technical violation and the parties were innocently violating it, oftentimes it drops down to the maximum rate. That's what a court might do. Or it'll drop down to something called the legal rate. Each state and, and uh, has a, a legal rate that if interest was intended to be granted, but the contract was silent to it, or the way in which the parties articulated it, it was too ambiguous or confusing, the court will implement what we call the legal rate. Massachusetts is 12%, for example. I just happen to know that because I'm kind of a rain man when it comes to facts sometimes. You don't have to know those specific facts. Just know that there's something called a legal rate that we default to if the contract doesn't have clarity about what the interest rate should be charged, but it was intended to be charged. And then there's a contract rate, which can fall where? anywhere from zero up until the maximum rate. That's the contract rate. If the contract is drafted well enough so that we know what the specific amount is. What's the usurious rate? Anything over that. And again, what can the court do? The court thinks it's really egregious conduct, can not only bar the creditor from getting any interest, but they could potentially even throw out the principal if it's considered something called loan sharking. It's a pattern of abusive uh, interest rate charging to abuse sort of the consumer, uh, they can do that. But usually it falls back down to either the maximum rate or um, the legal rate. And I can't tell you what they're doing in different circumstances, but we know if it gets very abusive, you know, and I, I dealt with people involved in these kinds of things where not just in terms of gambling contracts, but in just terms of lending money at exorbitant rates, like, um, hey, it's, it's, uh, it's, say it's Thursday afternoon, you pay me back, I'll lend you a thousand dollars today, you pay me back $1,500 on on, on um, the following Thursday, that's one week. That's thousands and thousands of percents of interest. That's obviously illegal and it would be considered probably a crime of loan sharking um, if it's so egregious and so unreasonable. Um, those don't come up too, too much though. So those are your serious contracts. You should know about them because most people I think that pay the most on interest rates are the poor people. Let's face it, wealthy people with good credit tend to pay the lowest on their credit card bills and on their mortgage interest rates. Poor people that struggle with getting good credit often have to pay a lot more. But there is a, there is good news. Our laws say that in order to have society have some kind of parameters to function in, we've got to create a cap and the cap is the maximum rate. And it's usually based upon a per annum. There are some exceptions to it, of course. Um, Contracts of an unlicensed operator, be careful here. There's a trick question on this one. Um, generally speaking, licenses are designed to do what? We want to make sure the people that possess that license have enough experience and knowledge and expertise and education in the area so you can get quality work. The other is, is we want to weed out people that maybe are, um, you know, social, uh, socially deprived. They're, they're, they're criminal in nature and they don't have the good ethical and moral standards. So we don't want them engage in certain professions so therefore they wouldn't be allowed to be licensed so it's a two-pronged sort of goal to have licenses one is to ensure ability and skill and the others ensure integrity um, not all licenses are designed to do that for example i'm a licensed attorney to be a licensed attorney I had to go through so much education has to pass an exam to prove i knew a little something about law but they also test you on ethical standards and also if you have any criminal background they do a check to make sure you're not you know kind of going to corrupt the profession Many things have uh, licenses that may not seem as um, sort of uh, heightened in terms of those inquiry, but they are real estate license, believe it or not, beauticians, barbers licenses. Those all relate to not only being cautious about human health and safety with certain kinds of diseases and cleanliness, but also skills. Uh, I, I talked to a barber. It was amazing how much uh, apprenticeship and things like that he had to go to just become a barber. I used to tease him about it quite a bit until I realized how much he had to really do. Now, careful here. Some licenses aren't designed to reflect skill, ability, and ethics. It's just to raise money for the government. 
And if that's the kind of license it is, and I can't think of any off the top of my head, I kind of think of a commercial fisherman. A commercial fisherman, not that they're not skilled in what they do, but it has no difference really about, you know, if it's a piece of cod and the fish is still alive when they gave it to you, it's a piece of cod and the fish is alive. Whether it was caught by a commercial fisherman or somebody out just out in their own little recreational boat catching the cod. There, the contract might be enforceable, even if the seller of the good wasn't a licensed seller of um, fish. Why? Because it was only designed to, to, to raise revenue. Now, could the non-licensed person be punished by the government? Absolutely. But it doesn't make the contract not nece you know, necessarily not enforceable. I think if, say, the community required all landscapers doing business in their community have to receive some kind of minor license. They don't go and get the license. They mow my lawn and do everything, and I was supposed to pay them 300 bucks. Um, can they enforce that contract against me? And I, can I raise the issue? They weren't a licensed a landscaper. No, because the landscaping license was probably designed just to raise money for the government and really nothing to do with the integrity or the quality of a landscaping um, company services. I think you get the drift on that one. So generally speaking, licenses, if they don't have a license, they're barred. And that, that's a good example as a realtor. Say, for example, a friend of mine, I want to sell my house. I want to get out of here. Been here for three months, tired. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been here a little longer than three months. Been here like eight months, but it, it, say I want to move again and you're taking marketing classes in the mountain. You think, Hey, I know all, how to put things up on the internet and Facebook and all kinds of social media. And I'll really advertise the heck out of your house, Corman. I'll take um, 2% of the gross sales. What do you say? If I can find a, a capable, willing buyer, we can consummate the deal. And they say, sure, let's assume you do all those things. You find the willing buyer. And I agree that you actually did that. And I agree. You actually did all that work. If you're not a licensed realtor, believe it or not, I could defend the collection of your 2% because you weren't a lot, you weren't a licensed realtor to practice in the state of Massachusetts. Now, is that ethical on my part? No. Can you do something called get quant Remember unjust enrichment? They provided a service I shouldn't benefit, but there's a concept that trumps it. And that's the law requiring a license in that area. So be careful if you're going to run into certain kinds of business and, and behavioral things where you're required to have a license, you might not get paid if the other side is, I don't want to say evil, but, you know, savvy enough to, to defend on those grounds. Next one, uh, contracts for the sale of prohibited articles. I already talked about that. You know, you're selling illegal drugs or uh, other things. I don't know. Uh, ivory horns from, from endangered um, elephants from the sub-Saharan Africa, you know, and things like they're banned under the precious, um, the precious, I should say, the uh, Endangered Species Act, things like that. And the big one that the book talks about a lot under the Sherman Act, and each state has things called mini Sherman Acts for the internally, and that is to avoid people doing basically unfair business practices. And we use this thing called the rule of reason. Was the business practice designed to injure consumer competitiveness and prices, or was it designed really to drive out competitors and to limit consumer access to others' goods and services of a like kind. And they look at the situation and determine whether or not it's designed to really chill competition and hurt the consumer in the long run and only benefit you financially, or is it just a real reasonable business practice in order to further grow your business? I'll give an example that came up against Walmart. Walmart won this case, but I think it was KB Toys at the time. I don't think they exist anymore. But Walmart has a fairly big toy section and Walmart was selling, I think it was Matchbox or Hot Wheels cars. I can't remember which one at nearly at, at cost or under cost. So they would lose a little bit of money on selling these hot uh, Matchbox or hot, uh, hot Wheels cars. They keep them in the back of the store. So you have to meander through all the, the housewares and the makeup and the, you know, the toiletries and, and, and the food section and clothing to get to the toy section. Their argument was it was a good business practice. They weren't trying to run out other toy companies and undersell them. And so all competition would dry up. They were just saying, we're trying to get people in the store. You know, we're willing to break even on a, a simple matchbox or Hot Wheels car if we can get them to buy a, you know, a gallon of a Thai detergent on the way out or, or some other products. It's just a marketing scheme to get them in the door. They prevailed on that. But other companies have had difficult time. If, for example, if you want to, uh, Microsoft had a hard time. It's almost impossible at one time in this country to get a PC like this one right here, not working on some kind of Microsoft platform. And so it was creating a mop, a monopolistic, um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a computer guy, but I, I believe it's, you know, basically, uh, the system that runs the computer processes all had to be based upon Microsoft. 
and competitors saying that was fundamentally unfair and it was chilling. I think it was Oracle and these other groups that were trying to create platforms were getting shut out of the business as a result of that. And Microsoft lost. They, well, they, lost, they settled the case. But those things come up quite a bit, trying to monopolize. And some people's monopoly is great. It creates a lot of efficiency. A lot of, a, if you watch, I'm, I'm big into history. I think some of you might even have me for a history class. There's a great documentary on PBS, and it sounds sexist because it is. It's uh, The Men That Made America. And it takes about seven or eight of these great men who are um, really responsible for some of the great, economic and industrial changes in our country. And they get into the oil barons, uh, Jay Rockefeller, they get into the steel with uh, Carnegie Mellon, and they get into the, you know, and all these different things and how they try to monopolize their industry from top to bottom in order to ferret out no competition. So if somebody's trying to put steel up in competition with uh, um, Vanderbilt or something like that, he would crush them by underselling them or, or paying their employees more to come work them for at least for a short period of time. And those are the things that violate the Sherman Act. Other things that are, are, are a little bit more shocking, I think it surprised some people. Um, contracts not to compete are a mixed bag. That comes up a lot and it might come up a lot in your lifetime. Some of you want to be accountants, great job in terms of money. My sister's an accountant, very, very busy in about two months from now or three months from now when tax season starts, that's where she makes the bulk of her money. Probably you will too as an accountant. But think about it. What if my sister wanted to hire you as a new rookie accountant, you get your CPA, hopefully, and she's going to hire you, but she's going to train you on all kinds of ins and outs on how to run a nice tax service. She might say in order for you to come work for her at some salary per year, CPAs make a ton of money now, right? So say you make it a hundred grand a year, start right out of right out of college, you get your MBA CPA thing. I don't know what it is. You got that degree. You come work for my sister. My sister say, okay, you're going to, you promise uh, that if you work for me for the next five years, we'll start off at, you know, 80,000 the first year, 20, uh, $20,000 raise in the second year, provided you get good performance reviews and you'll be up to, but if you leave at any time during the course of this three-year contract, you agree not to work for a competitor or open up your own accounting service within five years and 20 miles of her office location. That is a contract to restrain business. It's a contract that basically is denying competition. The law has said that it still serves a purpose sometimes to allow it in reasonable length of time and in reasonable geographical area. So as a lawyer, for example, if I went to work for a law firm and they said, hey, you know certain things about the law, but you don't know a hell of a lot, kid. You're going to come in here. We're going to teach you a ton of stuff. In order for us to do that, we're going to make a big investment in you in terms of intellectual sort of processes. We don't want you to open up your own law firm right here in the neighborhood uh, anytime soon or work for a competitor. So you have to sign a non-compete clause to say you won't work for another law firm in Worcester County or open your own within two years of leaving. Um, service. That probably would be upheld as reasonable. Why? I could work outside of Worcester County. It's not that big a community. I can work anywhere in Massachusetts, well, anywhere in the country, really. And the other is I can also uh, see the limit in the time, two years. That would probably be upheld. That happens a lot with business selling. Some of you want to buy a business. Some of you, I don't know if it's this class, but I always have a couple of um, cosmetologist hairdressers and they say, you know, after a while, I want to have my own booth now in a place, but eventually I want to open up my own shop completely. Well, you might find a shop that's currently open and the person wants to retire and sell it. Great. It's, I don't know, some famous name. It's got a large following. It's got a lot of goodwill. You buy that. What's to prevent that seller from opening up the original Flows hairdressing salon right across the street in a new improved address? You're going to say all the, all the little customers are going to follow her over because she's right there real close. So what would you put in the sale of that business when you bought it from her? A promise not to open up another hair salon with that name within five miles of that location for the next three years. It's a good move. It's a smart move. But contracts not to compete are only allowed if they're narrow in terms of length and in terms of geographical location. Others, price fixing, things like that. What's interesting about price fixing, this, this surprises a lot of people. You can't have a contract to set prices. So say, for example, you're um, a jewelry store and you sell Seiko watches. Seiko can give you the watch to sell, but Seiko can't set the price, believe it or not. Yeah, they're going to sell it to the store for a certain price, but it's up to the store to determine what they're going to sell it to the community, to the, to the consumer. And that's why if you've ever gone and look at cars, like a Toyota car or any kind of car, or a watch. Sometimes you'll see a sticker on it. What does it say? There's four letters. MSRP. 
that's four, I was going to say three, MSRP, manufactured suggested retail price because they can't dictate the price unless they do what? Sell directly to the public at outlet stores because that's considered price fixing, detrimental to the consumer, detrimental to society is what our sort of uh, trust busting days of Teddy Roosevelt and others that thought like him thought businesses can thrive and can be very big, but if they get too big and too strong, they chill competition and they ultimately hurt the consumer for the prices and availability of products. Chapter is pretty straightforward. Thing you need to know if the contract is illegal for only oh, the contracts against public uh, policy. I can't pay jurors to rule in favor of my client. I can't pay a cop to say, yeah, it was really dark out. I really didn't see your client too well. It might have been somebody else. Can't do that. Um, you can't promise someone that, hey, if you help me, my political can't. It can't be enforceable, obviously, but you know what this happens all the time. You help me in my political campaign. You can see the political buttons behind me. I'm a political junkie. And, you know, I'm going to hook you up with a job, a good paying job once I get in there because there's a lot of appointment power. That's not enforceable against me, nor should it be allowed to be even uh, mentioned because that's a that's a kind of contractor agreement that harms public service. We hopefully we get the most qualified people into any position. We know those things happen all the time, though, don't we? So those are things that injure um, or are void against public policy. Those related to marriage, be careful in the book. It may sound like eh, any contract that either, hey, I'm going to pay somebody to divorce their spouse, or I'm going to give them money to marry somebody, or I'm giving them money not to marry at all, are often illegal. Not always, though. My daughter just got married. She's 24 now. Could I have a contract with her for $50,000 not to marry until she was 25? Yeah, that could be illegally enforced because it's a reasonable period of time during, and we know that usually when you get older, you have a little bit more success in a marriage, not necessarily, but generally, that contract will be upheld. There's actually some famous cases that parents have a contract with the children to marry within a certain faith. You know, we'll give you so much money as long as you marry a person of this, this, this faith. Those have been upheld as reasonable in order to carry on traditions and things like that. But things like to never marry, or to marry outside of a race or in a race, those are things that are considered void against public policy. And the other one that's surprising is to divorce. Let's say, let's say I meet somebody and I think she's great, and I say, I say, you know, and she says, you know, but I got a husband and stuff like that. And I say, well, I'll make it worth your while. I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars if you divorce that guy. That con and then she does. <laughs> the contract against me is unenforceable. Um, why? Because it's considered against public policy to. Um, incite someone to divorce their spouse um, chances are they're not going to want to see me afterwards as a result of me not paying that hundred thousand dollars so contracts against public policy they're pretty straightforward um, there's a number of them that come up from time to time any kind of robbery there's a question in your book many of you are doing a homework those of you haven't done it yet uh, it's question eight about the town of Lunenburg Mass this is a national book or an international book really used and it comes right out of Lunenburg Mass that they contracted with Balthazar construction to do construction work but they didn't go through the appropriate bidding process is that an illegal contract yep what do you know about illegal contracts totally unenforceable even if they've done some work they're not entitled to anything it was a illegal contract it wasn't necessarily immoral it wasn't with bad intent tunnel Lundberg just worked with Balthazar before and thought it was they're a great company to do work with so they just kind of undermined the bidding process which is a legal requirement sometimes for municipalities and state government to enter into contracts for business and it was void against public policy but that's the chapter pretty much in a nutshell i think it's very straightforward most students do well with it if you have any questions concerns don't be afraid to give me a buzz